This is not another econ podcast. I'm Ian Kaneshiro. It happens thousands of times a minute. An online shopper clicks by and it sets off a series of events. And so it's easy to picture this. It's a simple package, starts off in a warehouse, and it embarks on an adventure across the country or even around the globe to reach a shopper's hands. And this is an everyday feat that is crafted by the unsung heroes of logistics. And in today's episode, we're joined by one of these heroes, Kevin Lawton, the founder of The New Warehouse. And starting as a temp in 2012, Kevin quickly climbed the ranks in distribution and operations management. He's been the driving force behind multiple new distribution center startups and has handled an array of logistics software from Manhattan to SAP. But it's not just about moving goods for Kevin, it's about moving knowledge. So with the new warehouse, he has created a platform for sharing the wisdom amongst industry professionals with decades of experience. Kevin, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Definitely happy to be on here and talk all things, I guess, logistics and warehouse today. Yeah. So Kevin, would you give us a, you know, a quick background synopsis of you, the new warehouse and kind of kick us off that way? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you did a, a good job there kind of getting some of my history, I, I guess you could say, and background, what I've been working in warehouse in some capacity for the last 12 years now wasn't quite what I intended to do with my career or or life but as you mentioned I started out as a a temp and then kind of took to it in in that sense and at some point I decided to embrace the industry and, and say like okay like this is where I'm gonna be for a while at least so let me learn some more about the industry and that that's kind of what sparked the podcast idea the new warehouse initially because i was younger at the time i was looking for information about the warehousing distribution industry and there was nothing too interesting out there you could say for (laughs) for younger people so i'm like why don't i create something that's interesting so i started initially trying to do a blog and quickly realized like i don't have the time to to write and then edit and then figure out how to even get this out there into the world. So I had my boss at the time actually was the one that suggested, hey, why don't you do a podcast? Like I heard podcasts are, are becoming a big thing. So I'm like, hmm, that seems that seems easier, right? Sit down in front of the microphone and and talk a little more raw, I guess, in the sense from a, from an editing standpoint. So I got a mic and I I tried it to figure it out and just you know happenstance got in touch ended up at a co-working space with somebody who has been doing podcasts for like several years and he kind of showed me all the ropes behind the scenes how to you know get the rss feed and get set up and all those things and it kind of just grew from there so it's been an amazing way to learn more certainly and i'm always been incredibly curious i guess in in a sense so so it's a great way to connect and learn about what's happening in the the warehouse fulfillment space and a great way to, to build the network as well I mean, it's also led to what our kind of current state of the business is now, which is not only the podcast. And I mean, I guess you could say it's like a, a media company at, at this standpoint, if we we're going to formalize it in some way, right? We have the podcast, we do our video stuff, we go to trade shows and, and do some things with companies there. We go on site and visit different companies. But within the last year and a half, almost going on two years, we actually opened our own fulfillment center as well. So we do e-commerce fulfillment as a 3PL. And so it's it's pretty cool to say that, you know, the new warehouse has a, a new warehouse indeed. And we get to not only, you know, do some of the things that we, we talk about on the show, but we also get to, to play with some of the solutions from the solution providers we talk about on the podcast as well, which is a great combination and a, and a great uh, fun journey for somebody like me that has a lot of curiosity in the space. Yeah, most definitely. I think that's a, you know, there's quite a bit to unpack there, but you know, it's yeah. funny that, you know, you never know where, especially in your like early days, kind of your first job or two, you never know where life's going to take you and what industry like you might fall into, you know, as a kid, you grew up to like, wanted to be like an astronaut, which is what I wanted to be when I grew up. And then, you know, you end up in, I ended up in software sales, you know, and it's just funny how that it was just by circumstance and who, you know, and the skills that you have and how you can apply it. So, um, 
Yeah. Well, I'll say that I wanted to be a chef. Like I really wanted to be a chef. And then I had a, a cousin who was a chef and I saw like the hours that he was working. I was like, I don't think like I can do that. Right. So then of course, like I get into logistics and I'm, you know, in the warehouse at like midnight doing projects and things mm-hmm. like that. And I'm like, I could have been a chef, like <laughs> you know, same crazy hours. So. Yeah. And I mean, I guess there's a lot of connections between, yeah. you know, being a chef and in logistics. Cause mm. if you think about it, like what is a chef? Like, or what does chef do? They have recipes yeah. and, you know, there's like a development process of the recipes and they take things that processes that already exist and they try to replicate it and they replicate it, you know, at scale. And, but they also try to, you know, innovate and improve on it and use new technology, I'm sure, and new tools. And so, you know, I think there's a, like a lot of bridges that can be made into like the logistics space. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the recipe is like the chef's, uh, SOP, right. And in, in a sense, right. So, yeah, I mean, and I think in, in logistics, I guess if you, if you put it in that direction, cause even like, you know, a chef, uh, executive chef would has their sous chef and, you know, all the other different, different roles, right. And you're a, a warehouse manager, I guess, or supervisor in a sense, you're the, you're the chef there, right. And you're driving that kitchen or, or that warehouse and, and making sure that you know, I mean, the, the chef, I guess, is doing fulfillment themselves in the kitchen. Most right? definitely. Filling the, the customer's orders out in the, the dining area. And it's the same thing within the, the fulfillment center. I mean, you're fulfilling those orders for the customer. But, you know, they're a little less time sensitive, maybe, I guess. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, dep- it depends who you ask. I mean, you know, I'm guessing, <laughs> like, what are some of these companies? There's like Cisco and Sodexo which are, you know, some of the biggest food distributors on the planet. And they operate warehouses at scale globally. And they are constantly worrying about how they get, you know, product to the right place. And they work on it like a, probably a just in time uh, philosophy. You know, you need to get the product to the customer at the right time and it can't be late. It can't be spoiled. And so there's like that whole part of the logistics chain. And then the chef has to do the same thing in their kitchen where, they are storing things that are similar to a warehouse, you know, it has to be in the right place, easy to grab. They have to know, they have that inventory and have to know everything about it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they, you know, you go to a restaurant sometimes and you, they tell you like, oh, actually we're out of this tonight. We've already sold out of this. Right. So it's around that inventory planning in the, the same regard, like you said. And I think uh kitchen has a little less storage too, right. Than a warehouse or a fulfillment center. So it's about, you know, making sure you get the, the right product and then also you know making sure you don't get too much product too because a lot of that food can can spoil pretty quickly so yeah i mean there is definitely a whole uh supply chain i guess you could say happening with it at that kitchen itself yeah i, I love that that's actually it's sometimes like hard to comprehend you know where our food comes from and like the yeah. whole like that whole complex system that about you know getting that food to your plate you know, you often hear about like things about farm to table and people wanted to go to farmer's markets because it's, it's a lot shorter and, you know, reduces the carbon footprint, but also re- it reduces costs. And so, um, you know, finding ways to, and you would probably know this better than me, but it feels like supply chains a lot of times are getting stretched further and further. And there, there's more hands touching, you know, each unit that's running through the supply chain, you know, people have to take their cut off to the companies and people yeah. have to take their cut off the top and that ultimately goes on to the customer oh yeah yeah absolutely i mean they're, they're the more you try to do for the customer the more cost there is essentially it's, it's interesting we um i teach as well and i'm teaching um introduction to global supply chain this semester for the first time we, we spend a lot of time talking about logistics cost versus customer service level trade-offs right and, and i think it goes back to what you're saying there i mean it's you know you have to understand that at, at what point does you you can't necessarily satisfy every customer 100 percent. you know custom i mean you may have some customers that want that product in you know, same day or want it in a couple hours but if the percentage of your Know, customer and order volume is not not driving towards that and it's just a very small percentage then you know you may have to say like it's not worth it to figure out and, and build out this infrastructure to to make that happen for you know one percent or order volume something like that i mean 
And you have to just say like, okay, we can eat those lost sales if we need to eat those lost sales, right? So it is about finding that balance because like you said, I mean, it, the more things you add in place and the more you know sophistication or shipping service levels you add, the more infrastructure you have to build down, it's you start to add additional fulfillment centers or 3PLs within your network, you make your supply chain a lot more complex you know, those costs are going to increase, right? And then, like you said, at some point, it's going to have to go and pass off to that consumer as well, right? And then at what point does that, is that breaking point where that price reaches a point where you see some consumers that just are not interested at that price point anymore? So it is a, it is a difficult balance. And I think it's increasingly more difficult as we see larger players in the space, especially, right? You know, one of them begins with the, an A for sure, right? Amazon. So, you know, as we see them like push towards, you know, faster delivery and, and things of that nature, like it drives the consumer mind and empowers the consumer more, right? Because they know that like, hey, like it's just possible, right? Like Amazon's giving me stuff like next day or, or even uh, like in my area now, like I can get overnight delivery i can order at 11 p.m and it's on my porch by like 8 a.m the next morning right so you know that's going to push consumers to drive that expectation from other brands as well that are not on amazon or or through their own channels right which which makes it increasingly difficult for those brands to to compete and keep up so it's i mean it's about figuring out where does your consumer and your customer really lie within those kind of logistics expectations and, you know, how can you best optimize for those those costs, whether it's through, you know, doing your own fulfillment or, you know, creating a, a great partnership network, whatever the case may be. But there is that that difficult balance in, in finding out what's that what's that sweet spot for my target customer. Yeah, I mean, most definitely, you know that Amazon is either one of the biggest or the largest logistics network on the planet. Yeah. Right. Huge. Huge. And. But you also pay for it. It's really funny, you know, people in the e-commerce space, you know, I speak to Amazon sellers all day and to, you know, people like you as well. And we're kind of aware of that idea that, you know, you pay to play. I can't get that overnight from Amazon. And oftentimes, you know, unless it's something that's, you know, from a really large company and and it might probably has like map pricing or MSRP and like an Apple AirTag from Amazon, that's going to cost the same whether you buy from Amazon or whether you buy from Walmart or wherever. Most of these other items could be more expensive on Amazon. And you realize that at the end of the day, you end up paying for the convenience. You know, my mom, for example, thinks that she's like, oh, Amazon is so much cheaper than everywhere else. I'm like, is it? Like, how do you know that? Have you been price checking? And she hasn't been. It's just this brand perception that Amazon has done such a good job at at saying, look, we are affordable and fast. And so what does that mean to, you know, people like my parents? It means that they are cheaper than everybody else and they'll still get it to me in two days. And that's not necessarily the case. I'm happy to buy it from a different retailer and get it, you know, later in the week, next week, or even go pick it up myself that you can do it for free at, I don't know, Target, which also doesn't necessarily have the best deals always, but also very good at brand perception. It's just super interesting how these companies have leveraged their logistics to the point that they still think that we still think we're getting a good deal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting because you, you know, you think about a, a product and like, I want to buy something. And I think, you know, the consumer perception is like to go to Amazon first in a sense, right? Cause it's, I think it's one thing, it's the convenience, like you mentioned, but then the other thing too, is that, you know, like that Amazon is going to have it, right? Right. That's the other thing too, right? It's, you know, you look at that, like, I, I mean, there's been so many times where, you know, I walked into a store looking for something, the store's out of stock and I ordered it from Amazon right in the store, right? So it's yep. like, that store lost a sale, but, you know, I knew like, oh, Amazon's going to have it. And it, it's just like that go-to for, for purchasing. And it, it's interesting because I, I was talking to a brand last week, actually on the, for a future podcast episode that we'll have and they were talking about, you know, they were talking about the idea of omni-channel and, you know, being able to, to sell through multiple marketplaces. And Amazon has really been a huge 
driver for their business, giving them like a lot of exposure and attention. But when it comes down to it for them from a business perspective, like they want the traffic direct to their website. Like that's where they have the best margins. That's where they make the most money. But they have a product that is, it's like a food product and it's harvested from a, a farm. So, you know, when it comes down to it and inventory is low, like it, they wish that like, hey, we're only pumping orders through our website, but it's like they have to shut every channel down except for Amazon, right? Because they're on SFP, Seller Fulfilled Prime. So, you know, they don't want to lose that because that is a lot of eyeballs. It is a lot of attention, right, to their brand and product. And even though they're not making the best margin on it, right, it's still that traffic and attention that, you know, is going to either, you know, bring in those first time customers potentially or whatever the case may be, have repeat customers or people that just like to shop on Amazon. So, I mean, it's very interesting to see how they've, you know, positioned themselves in the market to just be that convenience factor and just that ultimate go-to. I mean, I don't think, you know, you can't really have a discussion around e-commerce, logistics, anything like that without even mentioning Amazon, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, Amazon has their hand in, you know, so many different types of businesses. You know, we were talking about logistics before through FBA, but what what you're talking about here is them as a marketing channel, yeah. right? I'm a new brand. I want to get in front of as many eyeballs as possible. I'm entering the, essentially it's like a swap meet that is Amazon in order That's to true, yeah. reach as many customers. You know, it's the same thing that if, you know, back in 1995, if I had a new brand and I'm, you know, making, well, I don't know where I'm going, where we're going with this, but jamming jelly in my garage and I want to start putting a label on it and getting it out there, I would take it down to the swap meet. I'd pay the swap meet however much money in 1995. And that would be part of my marketing channel. And so now I don't have to do that. I can pay Amazon the 15% plus whatever FBA fees and my inbound shipping fees. But the 15% is, they call a referral fee for a reason. Yeah, They're taking that commission off the top. And they're not the only company that does this, you know, Uber Eats and DoorDash do it with your favorite restaurants in your local area. And, you know, companies end up paying a lot for these marketing costs. And people are like, we're not marketing. It's like, if you're selling on Amazon or you're a restaurant, you know, yeah. delivering via Uber Eats, that is a marketing channel. And we have to like chalk it up to as much. And then that in itself also ends up putting that extra cost on the customer because you're also paying a delivery fee and, and yeah. everything on top of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's a really interesting point because you see too, like some businesses, I mean, you talked about the Uber Eats, DoorDash, kind of some local businesses, uh, like, you know, you don't want to be on there, right? But I mean, it's kind of, uh, it it is a little bit of, I would say, uh, the wrong play from that marketing standpoint. So, I mean, you know, how many people are ordering on, on DoorDash every day, right? To, to get whether it's lunch or breakfast, whatever, dinner you know, you're missing those eyeballs at least like, you know, I mean, there's so many, so many restaurants that I would say like I've discovered or, or found on DoorDash that I otherwise probably wouldn't have known that were in the area or wouldn't have known there or even like stopped in, right, to, to know, right. But they had just happened that they were on DoorDash and they had like a certain food that I was looking for. So yeah, I mean, it's really important to, to take that into consideration from a brand perspective and you know i think ultimately like it does come down to you know the customer's pocket as well like as you mentioned and i I think you know we're seeing that and there's some some talk i think around that in street two where you know some of those additional costs around logistics and specifically are are going to start to get passed more back onto the customer where you know we're seeing a lot of free shipping types of things like the the talk i think in the industry now is that that's going to be kind of going away and customers are going to be expected to be paying for that shipping more more widely now i haven't heard so much as that can you unpack that idea a little so you know that means that because like a lot of times the free shipping you know customers are paying for that at the end of the day right they're, they're you're just building that into your price yeah yeah, I mean, it's built in there, but I think it's from the marketing standpoint, right? It's, you know, the customer has the idea that it's free, right? And I'm mm-hmm. for that shipping, right? But I, I think that 
way things are going. And I think a lot of what is driving this too, from what I'm hearing and conversations I've had is that just the overwhelming surge in returns. Um, because you look at, you know, customers are taking free shipping and they're taking that as a way to, especially from, you know, an apparel standpoint where, you know, if you go into a store, you're like, oh, I'm not sure if I'm a, a medium or a large, right? So in the store, I'm going to try it on, right? But at yeah. home, you're ordering something and it's free shipping. So I'm like, well, you know, I'm going to order a medium and a large and whichever one doesn't fit, I'm going to send it back as a return, right? So, so you're, you're seeing where companies, I think, and brands are getting bombarded with returns, which is expensive. It's a process. It's pain to process to, to be honest. Um, and you know, I think that they're going to start to push more on that, that charge for shipping to kind of, in a sense, try to, uh, I guess die down the amount of that happening where people are ordering multiples and then just returning like what they, what doesn't fit, right. To, to try and navigate that in a different way. And then I think on the return side too, I mean, you're going to see where potentially now, instead of having free returns, right, maybe there might be like a charge to return or you're going to see some, some more creative ways. And I think a lot of that is happening already. I mean, see, um, UPS just acquired happy returns. So I think that is going to be really interesting because, you know, Happy Return is really acquired by PayPal just within the last year. And now it's UPS has taken it, which makes a lot more sense. But I think there is like a real kind of a disruption in the industry for returns going on because, you know, to make it more easy to return and, and more cost effective for the companies as well. Because, you know, you look at returns and especially if you look at apparel or something like that, seasonal, if you get that return back, there's like a very, very small window that you can actually like reutilize that inventory again, right? If you're getting something that's like a, a jacket returned and it's, you know, coming back and about to be spring, like what is the likelihood that hey, you can turn around and resell that, that jacket again this season? So, I mean, I think that's kind of what's driving that. So, I mean, it'll be interesting to see for sure. I mean, I certainly see like some brands that, that I were from where, you know, I think previously like they've had free shipping or they marketed free shipping and now like shipping, it's like $5 or something like that. So, I mean, it's definitely popping up and it'll be interesting to see like how that kind of evolves over time. And especially as we look at faster delivery times too, and, and giving the customer more more variability, which goes back to like that logistics cost, right? So if you know our customers are looking for faster delivery, it's going to be more expensive for us on the logistics side. So you know, let's you know if they really want it, like let's charge them for that. Yeah, I think it that that idea of having a bit of an upsell to get the the service that I want is okay, yeah. is fine with me. But also, you know, if you if you're going to give me a three dollar break on something that I don't need tomorrow. Yeah. Then as a consumer, I'm happy to take it. But kind of jumping back into the idea, you know, of returns, you know, you're talking about, and there's a term for this, it's, you know, reverse logistics. How do we get that item back from the customer and back into a fulfillable model? And I think what, you know, a lot of times consumers don't think about, don't understand why it's so expensive to do so is because well, one of the most expensive parts of all of the logistics or delivery process is the last mile. And so with that logic, what that means is on the flip side, what's one of the most expensive parts of the reverse logistics? That would be the first mile, right? And Amazon has done a pretty good job at this in providing, you know, return drop-off points at their Amazon Fresh stores and Kohl's. And I think even UPS does this. And maybe with, you said, Happy Returns is the name of the company that you guys yeah. And so that's probably a little bit about like what they do as well. And so they put the onus on the customer to get that first mile taken care of because that will be a bit cheaper than, you know, scheduling a pickup, sending a truck there and then taking it back. But then like what we don't see is the fact that it has it's probably going to go on four different trucks before it goes to some warehouse somewhere and then you have a person standing there opening the box and and checking it, checking it back in 
prop maybe repackaging it. And there's this whole system that, that we can't see. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's really interesting and I, I think it's, you know, super smart how Amazon did that to try and mitigate those additional costs. Like even, you know, you saw, I don't know if they still do this, but when they started doing the Kohl's partnership, they drop off their returns, you would go to Kohl's, drop it off and, and you would get like a, a coupon. Kohl's, right? So it's like mm-hmm. incentivizing the customer to to go and, and do that because of the cost savings there. But I mean, to your point, the returns is from a process standpoint is not easy, right? From a logistics standpoint to, to handle, it's one thing to, you know, figure out how are you going to get this product from the customer back into our uh, possession as a brand in, in some way. But then when you get it, there's a whole another process. It's not a, you know, it's, I don't think consumers realize like it's not as easy as, you know, take that product out of the box and just put it back on the shelf. Right. I mean, depending on the product, like it has to be inspected, you know, was there anything wrong with it? Was it potentially just closed? Was it worn? Right. Do you have like deodorant marks or is there a stain on it? If the customer said there was a, a damage to it, you have to look was there a damage which can take time i mean that inspection process is i mean it's a one by one process right it's not like you're taking 10 returns from this company and you're just checking them in the system and throwing them on the shelf you have to look at all those pieces and figure that out and it's time consuming and it's messy in a sense uh, in some ways depending on what type of product you deal with. And then there's the whole side of if that product's not good to put back into inventory, whether it is damaged or has been worn or it's, we don't sell it anymore at this point, it's out of season. Now you have to figure out the whole disposition of that product and out where is that product going to go now? Are we going to, and a lot of companies are, are moving towards like a re-commerce type of program where you have lightly used products or they're repairing product and then reselling it as a furbished item or is it going to get donated is it just going to get scrapped and damaged and you see a lot of waste getting generated through that I mean, you know we talk about apparel i know there's a whole conversation about a bunch of apparel like you know ending up in just third world countries not getting recycled or anything like that i mean it's interesting and it's a very complex part of the supply chain and logistics overall and a lot of times too i mean that stuff like your returns is because it's so time consuming a lot of times your your resources if you're doing other things besides returns within that facility your resources are are not necessarily getting allocated or prioritized to the returns a lot of times that stuff is sitting there sitting there and then it just ends up being, now what are we going to do with this stuff, right? So, yeah, I mean, it's big, big problem and issue. And I know there's definitely people out there that are trying to solve the problem, not only from external, as we talked about, you know, getting that product from the customer back to the brand in some way, but also from like an internal uh, process standpoint too. So, yeah, I mean, it just continues to grow. I mean, you know, talk about peak season, holidays uh, around e-commerce, right? But then there's a whole other back end of the peak season too, as we go into January, February, that is all the returns like from that stuff. So it's, yeah, it's a big problem. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, Just like, you know, quick, a quick story about that is when I was, you know, 15 or 16, I was working for kind of a family business that had, that was doing like sports apparel and memorabilia and things like that. Traditionally from a catalog, but also in the very early, they also had a website and in the very early stages of, of Amazon as, as well. And, you know, we would be working up until, you know, December 23rd, yeah. even December 24th, some years, you know, just trying to get as many orders out as possible uh, before Christmas. Right. Yeah. And then I spent, and because I was, I was a low person on the totem pole, I spent the first few weeks of the new year swimming in returns yeah. and it was probably one of my least favorite part about the jobs because you had like the description and you had to find this hole that didn't exist and sometimes they sometimes the customer said something was wrong with it even though they might have ordered the wrong thing and what ends up happening is you know they either got you know boxed back up and then 
stacked on a pallet, wrapped up and shipped somewhere somewhere else to some liquidator, or it got you know put aside to the side of the warehouse, and then a few times a year there would be like kind of like parking lot sales, or we'd roll everything out where yeah. people would be happy to pick through these things for a deal. And this was 15 years ago, right? Yeah. And this was in the early stages of people starting to be okay with like buying things before they're actually touching it. And now when everyone is is down with it and there's companies like Shein that and fast fashion that oh, yeah. don't even care anymore, they just pump it out and they don't even want the returns back because they don't know how to handle with it. You're right. It just becomes, you know, there's like this massive problem from a logistics standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, and it's just going to get worse. And, you know, I'm not convinced that it will ever get better. It'll just get pushed more to the side of like our, our comprehension in our minds that yeah. we, you know, if it's out of sight, it's out of mind. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a pretty uh, interesting point too about like the, the sheens. Like, I mean, it, it, as a company too, like, you know, there is that decision of, is it even worth it? for us to take the return back, like the cost of the return, like just keep it and we'll send you a replacement, right? Because it's, I brought that example up in my class actually that I teach and the students were like, like don't companies lose like money doing that? And I'm like, no, actually like sometimes like depending on how much it costs for that item to be made and manufactured, like, I mean, you actually will lose money if you take the return back, right? I mean, it's better to just, you know, cut the loss and- Especially if it's damaged. Yeah. 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 It's like, it's not worth it to go through all that stuff. So, I mean, it's really interesting and, and yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it's just gonna continue. I think it's going to take a long time to get that problem under control. I think there's some brands like, I mean, I see you're, you're wearing a Patagonia t-shirt. I mean, I know they have a, a re-commerce program where they repair stuff and, and resell like refurbished things, but it's going to take a long time for that to widespread or, or figure out a way that they're a one size fits all or something for the brands to, to do that. So it's going to be a continued, continued problem for sure. Most definitely. And to kind of go off the note of like the Patagonias of the world, right? Yeah. They do it because it's part of their mission and they do it because yeah. they charge more for their brand. And so it's part of their sustainability efforts that, you know, you pay a bit more to have these services and then they'll, they'll renew it and, you know, provide provide their, that same material and those same clothing items for a discounted price, but it's something that didn't have to be remanufactured. It's just a stitch or a patch. And then also people like that. It's a bit unique, but I think their wardware program is quite clever. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So Kevin, as we kind of near the end of this episode, I wanted to provide an opportunity, you know, if do you have any like final thoughts or any like summations from anything that we, we spoke about today? Sure. Yeah. I'll say logistics is hard, right? <laughs> that's the name of this episode right there logistics is hard so i i mean it's certainly a lot of complexities and i think that you know it's very important to understand not only from a, a brand perspective but also a consumer perspective that there is just so much that goes in to getting that box on your doorstep okay and the more that we understand that and are able to unpack that i guess no pun intended there but Nice. Unpack that, right? You know, we're able to figure out like, where do we have, you know, some gaps, like we talked about, you know, some environmental impacts and, and things like that. And, and how do we, you know, go about it? You know, maybe smarter consumers, but also, you know, as a brand providing better to and, and leveraging partners that, that make sense to bring that better, not only consumer experience, but overall like business experience too. So, yeah. So, I mean, I think it's, it's really important to, to note that and, and understand the complexities and understand, uh, you know, what options are out there too, as well from a solution or, or partner perspective, you know, continuously try to, to make your overall supply chain better. Yeah. I can really, I can really kind of picture how, you know, some of these things might get better for the consumer, but worse for the companies in the long run. But you're right. I think, you know, back in the day, UPS used to have their slogan. I think we love logistics. And I think they changed it because they realized that logistics is hard. Yeah, it's funny. I haven't seen that or heard that in a while. So I wonder what happened to that. Yeah. Because they figured it out. They figured that they don't love it anymore. Yeah, no, it's like a love, a love hate relationship. For sure. Maybe they're on the hate side right now. <laughs> but all right. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us today. Not another econ podcast. 
know, it was really great speaking to you about, you know, kind of the inner workings of the logistics change and of the logistics and supply chains and learning and being able to pick your brand. So again, thanks so much for joining. Yeah. Thanks for having me on and, and definitely, uh, I appreciate it. Thank you.